Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our 31st show where we get to answer your mountain bike tech related questions. Any questions you've got, add them in the comments below this video or fire them into the email address at the bottom of the screen right there. Uh, don't forget to use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech so we can find your questions. Right, so first up, Ask GMBN Tech. I've got problems on all of my pedals. They're always creaking. I put grease on the threads, but it doesn't work. I've brought so many pedals to creaking problems. Any tips? Um, well, my instant thought is it's not the pedal. If it happens on all of your pedals, that it might be something else on your bike or on your shoe. So firstly, do you use clipless pedals? I do you clip into your pedals? If so, then it could be a loose cleat. It could be a protruding cleat bolt that makes the cleat creak on the pedal. That's worth checking. Uh, and of course your cranks. Um, and then everything that goes along with that. So what you think might be the pedals, it could be any part of that part of the transmission because it's all load bearing, all the torque goes through there. So check your actual crank bolts onto the uh, bottom bracket spindle. So normally an eight millimeter, and sometimes it's on the right, sometimes it's on the left, depending on what brands you have. Check your BB cups are in correctly. Check it's not the BB itself creaking. If you want to know about that, we're going to put a link in the description below this video for how press fit bottom brackets can sometimes creak and how to stop it if it is that. And check your chainring bolts as well. They're always a likely contender. Even if they're a fraction loose, or they have some sort of grime in amongst the threads, they'll creak. So you're gonna to have to check all of these things and hopefully you'll find the answer to it. Good luck. Ah, nice quick one here. Ask GMBN Tech, is it okay to use zip ties to set the sag on your suspension fork? Yes. But in all seriousness, you can use them, but don't leave them on the stanchion tubes. So that's the upper tube of your bike. And the reason for that is because they're made of quite a tough material. They can actually scuff and scratch the surface. So if you're gonna do this, Try this little method, it's also good because it'll save you a few quid. Normally, you would put the cable tie in this way, do it up tight, and then probably snip the end off. Set your sag, maybe monitor it over the ride, and then you've got to worry about cutting the cable tie off. Now, of course, the stanchion tubes on any suspension fork are very easily scratched, so you've got to be careful in the way you cut it off. So a better idea is to actually reverse the zip tie, and you put it on backwards, tighten it up so it won't lock in the same way. Um, you can find a way of tucking this in somewhere check your sag and then afterwards you can just pull it off again and you can reuse that. So a much better solution for just wasting the cable tie and you're not gonna scuff your tube because you can take it off. Okay, next up is wheel related, uh, in particular building wheels. Hi Doddy, I've got to build some new wheels and I was wondering what the difference is between lacing patterns, two cross, three cross, four cross, uh, especially in terms of stiffness. I've always used three cross, but was thinking maybe two because the spokes are a bit shorter and could stretch less. Uh, thanks in advance. Okay, so there's various different ways a wheel can be built. The four common ones are radial, two, three, and four cross patterns. Radial is obviously the spoke going straight from the flange of the hub and fan like straight out to the rim. And then you get two cross where the spoke will cross over twice and then three and four cross options. Four cross are the strongest and they form a bit more of a structure because the spokes overlap each other a lot more, but they do involve longer spokes, so therefore it is gonna be slightly heavier. And it's also a bit harder to build. So a three cross is the optimum. It's easy to build, the spokes are a bit shorter, and they're very strong, very reliable, and it's probably the most common form of bicycle wheel. Uh, especially if you're getting a set of custom hubs, let's say Hopes or Chris Kings laced up on some, I don't know, Mavic rims or Envy rims or whatever. Uh, you can do two cross as well. It's less seen on mountain bike wheels except for purpose-built wheels. Uh, we'll get there in a second though. Now, one of the downsides with traditionally spoked wheels, four cross, three cross, etc., is that on extreme dish wheels, so you're seeing wheels now changing shape because you're getting stuff like 157 and 148 spacings on the back. On extreme dishing, Traditional spoked wheels, which will use a J-bend spoke, and combine that with the fact it's got a bend to get through the flange, and it bends as it crosses over the others, it creates more problems in a wheel because the spokes can actually become stressed, and that does lead to breakages in the long term. So off the back of that, you're seeing brands like Mavic developing wheels with using multiple patterns, like radial and a two cross, for example. So they're trying to get like, keep the weight down to a minimum, keep the stiffness up, because you think the wheel itself actually has to do quite a lot. It's got to cope with all the twisting forces from day to day riding, you know, pushing your bike into a berm. Don't forget that your hubs, front and rear, they can't form part of the structure of the bike. Then I've got to cope with the acceleration and the braking, which go in different ways on the hubs. There's a hell of a lot it has to do, so it's really important you pick the right option for you. Uh, two cross, obviously, the spokes are going to be shorter again, but because they don't overlap as much, they're not going to be quite as strong in a wheel set. So they might be ideal for something like cross country, but if you if you like to throw your bike around a bit, probably three cross is gonna be better for you. 
Ah, this is a cool one. This is from Wade Cox. Uh, Dolly, I'd love to see a video on how to make a cheap tire insert like Cushcore, Victoria Airline, etc. I really want one, but they're very expensive. I'm thinking some kind of hack video. Uh, actually, Neil was on about this the other day because he's racing the, the Enduro World Series finals at Finale Liguri. Hopefully, I'm going out with him to sort of do a bit of spannering work on his bike. And we've been talking about how he should set his wheels up. We're obviously going to set up tubeless and we're looking at like fail safe options just like Cushcore. And of course, there's a lot on the market. So I think we're going to be calling in quite a lot of them so we can do our own research and see what works. But also, I think it's a great idea for us to have a go at making a few ourselves. I know that Tom, who works on our social media, he's got some friends that are developing their own system, so I'm going to speak to them and see how they've gone about it, and I reckon we can make a really good video there. Okay, this is a good one. So, um, I'm having a creaking noise from my headset or fork when rotating the bars doing a track stand or going over the bumps. So I put on a new crown race and a complete set of bearings, no change. I swapped the fork onto a different bike, swapped the tyre, threw axle, the noise was still there. The steer's got some minor wear, but no players felt on the headset. Is it? Have you got any idea where the noise is coming from on the fork? Thanks for the help. Um, just the first one, just to be clear. So you say you put a fork on another bike. Does that mean you tested the fork out on another bike, or you put another, you took it off and put another fork on your bike to see if it still creaked? Um, if you're talking about the fork that was on your bike originally creaking, and then you put it on another bike and it creaked, then clearly it is the fork itself. If not, it will be your frame. So if it's the frame, it could be set headset cups in the frame, in which case knock them out of the frame, give them a clean, make sure the frame hasn't like bailed out or it's got no cracks in it, clean them and reinstall those, reinstall your fork, hopefully that's the solution. Um, it could be a crack in the frame, I hate to bring a bad news to you. Um, when you're washing your bike I always advise people to you know sort of go over them the fine tooth comb and just check all the sort of stress areas all around the head tube being one of those areas. But in your case, what I think, if I've read this right, um, the fork creaks when you put it on another bike totally and you've changed the headset cup, you've changed the bearing, so you've done all the other stuff. So to me, it sounds like it could be the steerer tube creaking within the crown. Now, although this is not common at all, I've had this on a couple of forks in the past, it's just unlucky if it happens. It'll be something that happened in a factory when it's push fitted to start with in there and it's just worked its way a tiny bit loose. Now, I don't know if you've got Rock Shocks or Fox or whatever your fork is you haven't actually said here, but get the serial number on there and then go to your bike shop and see if there's any sort of recall information, because it does happen time to time, and they might be able to advise you on there, but I reckon that is what it is, because there's not many other things on a suspension fork that creaks, like you said about the checking the through axle on that. Literally, like, that is about it. So, fingers crossed for you, that is what your problem is, and you can sort it, and hopefully it's not a crack in the frame. Street Hawkers wants to know, is it suitable to use the fuel from his dad's chainsaw, which he's already done by the way, uh, to clean his chain with? Um, is it a bad thing? Okay, Street Hawkers, yeah, you can use fuel or kerosene, uh, assuming that is what you've been using and not the two-stroke oil from the chainsaw. Uh, two-stroke oil, I can't imagine that's any good and it's only going to gunk up your chain. Uh, the fuel itself, yeah, you can use that to clean the chain with. It's not going to be as effective as an out-and-out -out degreaser or a like a specific chain cleaner, but you can definitely do it. Um, I don't need to be the person to tell you that vapor is extremely flammable and really it's not the ideal thing to be using a chain with, uh, cleaning a chain with. So preferably not, but yeah, you can, and you've obviously proven that. If you do continue to use it, just make sure your chain is fully clean and dry afterwards, maybe clean it with some water, give it a wipe down, because you don't want any of that residue on there when you put the oil back onto your chain links. The whole point is that, that when you put a chain oil on, it needs to penetrate into the rollers and the pins of the chain to do its job properly. And if you've got any sort of solvent, any fuel, or anything on there, it's gonna help that not do its job. So just make sure it's fully clean. Next up is from Beto AG. Dolly, great show. I'm itching to pull the trigger on a 2018 Canyon CF Lux 7.0. Nice bike, dude. Um, love the build, except maybe the grip shifts. Any thoughts on those? Also, um, can I get a discount if I tell them you sent me? And would you, what would you upgrade on the bike besides a drop post? Um, you can try the discount thing. I'm pretty sure it doesn't work because I've been trying that myself for ages. But um, um, as far as upgrades on the bike go, I would personally have a look at your particular one there. It does look really nice. I'd swap out the rear tire. I don't get on with the Icon too well. It's too much of a low profile XC tire for me. I'd use that front tire, the Ardent, on the rear and I'd get something a little bit more aggressive on the front, but that's just me. You know, that doesn't apply to everyone out there. 
Um, I probably fit some wider bars just looking at it as well. They're quite narrow on there. And although I know it's like an XC trail bike, um, I still like a wide bar. It's about what fits me and what feels nice, not about how aggressive a bike necessarily has to be or be perceived. As far as the grip shift goes, actually, I quite like them. Um, they're a bit odd and grip shift used to be terrible. Um, if you can imagine what the name used to be back in the day or how they were referred to, it wasn't, certainly wasn't grip shift, put it that way. Um, but grip shift these days is genuinely really good. Seen it on a lot of the XC World Cup bikes. It's super light because it's basically just some sliding parts with a spring system in there. It works exceptionally well. Um, I urge you to try it and see how you get on. A lot of people don't like it. It does depend on how you position your hands on the grips. Now I tend to run my hands right to the outside of a set of grips anyway and run my brake levers really far inboard and I would just move in to change gear sort of thing. But if you're one of the riders that likes to butt the hand up against like the flange of a grip um, then you might not like it because as, as you go over rough terrain you could accidentally change gear. But definitely give it a try and they look so neat on a handlebar with no extra sort of pods hanging down with extra cabling. Super clean and tidy. Um, definitely try them. Hi Dolly, can you please explain how a derailleur clutch works and how it works because mine doesn't seem to do anything when it's turned on and off. Uh, yeah, I can, it's fairly simple. It's essentially a friction damper on the pivot of that lower cage. And in fact, actually there's a bike just behind the camera. I'm just gonna go and get it and I'll show you. Okay, so I haven't got one of my bikes here to show you because my bike's both got SRAM on at the moment, but this bike has a Shimano rear derailleur. So as you can see here, it's got a clutch that is in the on position and down is in the off position. And what this affects is it's in this part of the radio here, it's basically a friction, you know, it dampens basically that pivot point. So when you put the clutch on, it makes that substantially harder to basically pivot. Now I'm just gonna show you the inside of this so you can get your head around this a bit. It's quite simple. It's the same sort of system on all of them on the market, although they might look very slightly different from the outside. This is obviously quite a high-end one. This is a Shimano Saint downhill derailleur, but all the Shimano ones will have a lever. Some will be gray in color, some will be black, and then some of the high-end ones like this will be gold. So bear with me, I've just got to take these bolts out. So there you go, the protective cover is off. And as you can see, you see the pivot point there? This is with the clutch off, so you can see it actually moving on the derailleur itself there as I move the cage forwards. Now note that it's basically wrapped all the way around the outside there, and it's literally, as I apply the lever, it closes that, so adding that additional friction onto it. So it makes it substantially stiffer. Now you can actually tune that on this particular derailleur by tightening this up a little bit more. Can't do that on all derailleurs, but it sounds like your one just isn't engaging properly. So you might want to have a look and make sure it looks like that. Make sure there's no problems going on. They're fairly simple though. That's how they work. And just to finish the show this week, is some really cool special news that we've got a guest coming in to join us in a couple of weeks time. And his name is Calvin. To you or I, he is Mr. Park Tools. He is the guy with the great moustache that you see in all the Park Tools tutorials. This guy knows everything about bike tools. And we're gonna to be doing a special Ask GMBN Tech with Calvin, of course. So get all your questions in specifically for Calvin. Use the hashtag, the one on the screen, Ask Calvin, and make sure you get them in, put them in the comments, send them in to the address at the beginning of the show. Anything mountain bike tool related, he is gonna know the answer, so get those questions coming in. And for a couple more videos, firstly, click down here if you wanna see our XTR Geek Edition, where I take a look at the whole transmission, the whole group set, including the brakes and that wonderful new rear hub. And click up here for something a little bit different. I get to try my first e-bike mission, basically. So a little bit, it's not really tech in the same way, but I'm riding a very tech-heavy bike, a specialized Kinevo. And that's out with Steve Jones from EMBN, so check that one out. It's a very cool, very different video. And show a bit of support for our EMBN brothers over there. As always, click on the round globe to subscribe to GMBN Tech. We love having you around. And make sure you tell any of your mates that might need some help fixing their own bikes about us. And of course, if you like fixing bikes and you like Calvin from Park Tools, give us a thumbs up.